Hello and welcome to this talk about ephemeral development environments. My name is Mike Nicholas, I am a customer success engineer at Gitpod and I will be joined later on by Anton who is a software engineer working with me at Gitpod as well. Today I want to introduce you to the concept of ephemeral development environments. Rather than what we currently have where we have a local environment and we start on adding dependencies and runtimes uh, for each different project, what I want to introduce is a concept of having a development environment fully automated, all configured for each individual task, pull request, or any kind of work we do, depending on what we want to work on. Before we dive into that, I want to just reiterate what a current workflow looks like on a local development environment. Now, the thing with us developers is that over the years, we've just become accustomed to all these things that have to happen in order to be productive that we don't think there is much wrong with it. In fact, though, I think there's a lot of work that we do with setting up tooling, uh, dependencies, making sure we have the right things at the right time, at the right place. This is all taking away time from being productive, adding value to the business or the project, and delivering features that eventually help our end users and achieving their goals, right? Now, this is a diagram where I kind of walk through from left to right in terms of how we work in a local development in our environment. We go from setting it up the first time we get the laptop, installing all kind of runtimes and editors and things like that, to setting up a new project where we clone the source code, we install uh, runtimes, making sure we have the right version of Node or Java. Moving on to developing a new feature where depending on how long ago we set up the project, we yet again have to validate that we have the right runtimes. We have to make sure we have the latest um, dependencies. We have to install the latest dependencies if we don't have them yet. So again, there's already a bit of repetition that I really don't think is necessary. Now, where it gets really interesting is when we're working on a feature in, in the feature branch and a colleague taps us on the shoulder or pings, on, pings us on instant messaging, asking us to review one of their hotfixes that are solving a critical bug in production. It needs to be reviewed right away. It needs to be merged right away so that the bug is no longer in production. In our local development environment, what that means, if we kind of dissect the different steps, is that we have to somehow get our code stashed or committed. We have to pull the latest branch of, from our coworker, change to that branch. Potentially, we have to install new runtimes or upgrade dependencies, depending on what that PR fixes. And then we do our actual work. Work here means reviewing the pull request, making sure the bug fix actually works. When we're satisfied and we give the approval to merge, we then have to go back to our local environment, you know, switch back to our branch where we were before, make sure we downgrade any dependencies or runtimes that we upgraded for the PR so that we're back onto a state that works for our branch, and then we can continue working. That's a lot of work just to review a pull request when all we really want to do is basically just look at the code, run it, and then approve. So in summary, we select the project, we do a bunch of stuff every time we want to work on something, and then we start coding. That's a lot of work. What I want to do is none of that, because that can be automated, and this is where Gitpod comes in. Let me walk you through how it works at Gitpod when we have an issue and we open a pull request for that issue. So what we're gonna do is over here on our website repo, we have an issue from Anton that he created yesterday. The issue asks me to change the header color to our brand color, which uh, represents a kumquat uh, color, so orange-ish. Now, we just walked through what this would look like in an existing environment, and you can imagine you being in the seat here and having to do that yourself, the way it works with Gitpod is very different. First of all, 
You can see I have a Gitpod button here, thanks to a browser extension. However, I can also do this differently. What I wanna do, I wanna spin up an environment automatically by basically opening a ephemeral development environment specific for that issue. What that means is that I wanna tell Gitpod that I'm working on an issue and I want Gitpod to create me a branch because that's really what I need, right? I need a branch, I can do my code changes, merge it back into main branch. So instead of clicking the button, the alternative to that is you can go to the URL, type gitpod.io hash and hit enter. This opens a context aware um, workspace. Context aware in this case means that Gitpod knows that I'm working on an issue and I'll show you in a minute what it did. The next thing we notice is it's pulling down container image and this is basically our underlying um, development environment. This has all the runtimes, the correct runtimes. It has all the dependencies. It has all the things installed, operating system libraries, anything I need underneath in order to develop my software. So you can see the VS code, just the same VS code as you know from your local environment, start it up and shows me the welcome screen just as you as you're used to from your from your local environment the other thing that it's doing down here you can see that it's running um, a bunch of commands so in my case this is a, a, um, a node based uh, project so it's doing npm install and it ran that before i even got to the point of opening my environment what it did when i started the environment it did npm um, run dev, which starts up my development server and everything happens basically in, in, in a few seconds. So that was probably a timing issue, but if we reload that, we will get a preview of the website in my local development environment here. And give that a second, there we go. Start it up, we can see there's hot reloading going on, it's all happening. now. The next thing is we have to change the color here. So I know because I worked on it that this is under um, the hero swelled file. There we go. If we go down, we have the text uh, right here. And we want to change the color to um, text orange 800. So we can see the preview here as well because I installed the extensions for VS Code. They're pre-installed automatically because this project works with Tailwind and Svelte. So both of these um, extensions are here. I'll show you in a second where that happens. So we see we want to use the brand ripe um, color. So we say 800. Fantastic. We switch back over here to the preview environment and we should be able to see the new orange color that I just set. Now, how did Gitpod know which uh, extensions I install and how did it know which commands to run in order to get me to that point? I didn't have to install anything myself or run any command by myself. If we close that, we have a gitpod.yaml file right here. And as you can see, there's certain ports that we defined. So 3000 is our development environment port. We opened that in preview. We could open that in a browser to use the dev tools as well. And we have a task uh, list here. So we have an init phase, which is npm install. That happens every time somebody pushes a commit to the repository. And Anton will talk about that in the later talk, uh, later half of the talk. The other thing that happens is I'm running a couple of commands to fix a, a bug in an existing library. And then I'm running npm run dev, which spins up my development server. And all of that happens without me doing anything at all. So that's fantastic. We have our code fix. We verified that it's all good. The next step is we want to open a pull request. So we can come over to the pull request view on um, in source control. We can say change the header uh, color to kumquat. Okay. Uh, we can manually add that or just hit enter either way. So we add the change. And the next thing is we commit. All right, all done. Now, 
we also want to open a PR. So if we look down here, we can see that I'm on a branch Mike Nicholas slash demo changes header color 384. That was auto generated by Gitbot because Gitbot knows I'm working on an issue. So all I need to do now is just click the button here, create pull request. There we go. I have that. I can put in a description if I want, um, leave that empty. And then I can say create, hitting that button. It says that we are not currently tracking this um, uh, branch. No problem, let's publish it. Happens under the hood. Okay, and the next thing you can see that the VS Code opens my um, pull request review. So I can overview, I can now look at what's going on. The other thing is if I go back to um, the PR, we will see that that pull request is opened as well. So what I do now is I can just close the tab and that development environment will disappear automatically or I can go here and I can say stop workspace that'll shut that down and then we're, we're good to go. So if we go back to the demo issue and I didn't actually link it to this, that's fine. We're going to pull requests and open the header. So you can see my pull request is here. The files that I've changed, perfect. And now I'm going to hand it over to Anton who is going to show you how it works when he reviews that pull request and makes changes to it. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the talk. Hi everybody, it's Aton here. And today we are going to do some pull request reviews. So here's a PR from Mike, which he created yesterday, and I want to review it. I could just prefix this URL to get what I ought to start a new workspace, but the thing is about websites that we have here installed git pod github application which can prepare workspaces like pre-built workspaces for us for the concrete branch in advance and i can start it just by clicking details here so as i mentioned here it doesn't now build from scratch but it, it builds it takes a result of pre-built which was done yesterday after mike's push chain cha changes so it's saying loading pre-built and now id will pop up Okay, so let's have a look at terminal. It thinks that it's already started the dev server, which sweetly kit will do some build in advance. But what we can interesting if you scroll up a bit, you see this message: we start to run a workspace for build. And in fact, everything what is above was done asynchronously, not now before, and only this part is happened now. So you also can see in previews that. My exchange is already here that header is in color quote, and it's nice. Another thing which Mike mentioned already, that git pod is context aware. And it means that of pull request, for example, it preloads PR in the within IDE. So if I click here on the activity bar PR view, it gives me all files which have been changed. And we can click on the Divino files like here's virtual here to to see changes, you can also comment. Okay, nice, thank you. And start a view on GitHub. Obviously, we have full richness of IDE here, full contentcy support for instance. So you can use it for CSS in uh, JavaScript, I think. And you can get an overview of pull request information within IDE. So it's quite, quite quite similar to what we see on GitHub, and if you go to GitHub, for instance, our, my comment is here already. The thing is, if also Mike comes tomorrow and starts another workspace for this pull request, he could address this comment within IDE. And the lastly, you can also approve all request changes from VD. So now, now let's go to slides and talk about what is pre-built and why it's important in context of Gitpod for a Sigla developer. So with Gitpod, I don't have anything to check out locally. Whenever I have some task, I start a new workspace, right? I have an issue, I create a workspace. I have a PR to review, I have a workspace. I found some cool JavaScript project internet. I want to just check out what it's doing, check out demos. I start another workspace. For some workspaces, I don't do any changes. And when I'm done, I just close the tab and it's gone in two minutes. 
it's completely disposed array, so it doesn't exist anymore. You, and in some, I exchange code, obviously, but sometimes I also change a description of our development environments. And afterwards, I push it to GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket, whatever you're using. And here's the thing. You can think about Gitpod as a CI server, but for development environments. So it's monitoring changes and push, pushing, pulling them. And since it started a special build for dev environments and your application on top of it. And as a result, it produced so called pre built dev environments and then shut again to the startup of the workspaces. And if for some branch we already pre built uh, dev environments, then it doesn't, it takes very fast to start them. And it's very important to scale ephemeral development environments. So here we look at website application, but in fact, it's not so uh, takes so long to build static website. It's more important, like if you have complex projects, think about microservices or Kubernetes applications or something that takes really long, like 10 minutes to build, Gitpod may make a huge difference there. There is also another part of feedback loop here is if build failed. So if you change description of your Definitely, like you edit a new tool, Docker image, or you upgraded it, and it breaks the build, then you want to be notified. You don't want to land it on the main branch and breaks all other developers going like, oh, why it doesn't work anymore, but it works for you, because you had before locally it installed, but now nobody has it. But you fix your build, you make sure the Gitpod has a green check and then you merge it. It's obviously very useful also if you have public, popular open source projects with a lot of incoming pull request changes. If you pre build them all in advance, you come in the morning, you just new start taps, you don't wait for the build, you review changes, think, see what they're doing, like in 10 minutes, and you close all your stops and gone. And we don't need to go far uh, to experience it. In fact, Gitpod itself is Kubernetes application built by multiple software engineers using multiple languages, different runtimes, have multiple uh, different components running in Docker and Kubernetes using database and so on. And when we started building it, when we experienced it, we obviously we are using our local machines because we do, couldn't do, dog food yet. And it was not pleasant experience because each de developer need to run Minikube, have Docker, waste a lot of time pulling with images, machines get really hot. And personally, me, I work on uh, IDE integration in Gitpod, like VS Code. And uh, I'm not interested in all these parts. I would like to go and start co coding uh, IDE part, right? And then try, try out more changes. I don't want to deal with Kubernetes context that identification against Google and if something goes wrong, trying to fi fi fix Kubernetes. And so now, after years of developing Gitpod in Gitpod, I code show our current experience for, to you. So here I have an issue in Gitpod, and I just prefix it with Gitpod IO, IO as usual to start another workspace. And while it's happening, uh, there's a special CI build for Gitpod. So there is Gitpod CI, which creates dev environments, but there is a usual CI. In our case, we use Burst, which are highly optimized CIs for, for us. And what it does, it for each branch, it creates a version of Gitpod with changes from this branch. And at the end, it gives us URL. If I follow it, you see it's not Gitpod.io, but it's something with my branch in the name. And these preview environments connect it to my dev environments for this branch. So here we already have Gitpod for space started for the same branch. And it says I save six minutes. It's nice, but I wanted to, what I wanted to show that it has kubectl tool installed. It's a, a tool who doesn't know to manage Kubernetes application, and we can watch what kind of ports are running in it. Oh, sorry, which? And just to verify, I will go to my preview environments. I will start new workspace, and you will see that here, PPTL notice that a new container creating. So it's easy as at the, at the, like that. If I go to issue, I start a works, uh, create a branch, it, will, it gives me pre-built developer environments, it gives me preview environments, it connects it, and I can just start working. I don't need to deal with anything else. So there's many other exciting things about Gitpod, 
For example, I show you only one way to calibrate asynchronously, which makes a lot of sense right now, right? We work remotely and asynchronously. For example, Mike lives in Canada and I live in Germany. And even prepare this presentation, we work asynchronously because we have like one or two hours to, to sync. But you also sometimes could live share your workspace, for example, to give to try to give someone to try changes immediately or help to get a help, like debugging help. You can create a snapshot of very space spaces, uh, which are very useful to reproduce tasks or bugs or create uh, tutorials. It's basically like it captures really a state of your workspace at some point of time and can then spawn another workspace from it. What the best what you could do now? Just go to any GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbot package package. It prefix Gitbot or to try. After that, you can go to our website, documentation, learn about how you describe your dev environments, how you automate, how you enable a GitHub application to get these three builds. And if you struggle with something, if you have questions, you join our community. We are there to help you to improve your developer workflows. And thank you for watching. Bye bye.